Thank you for listening. This is the Legends Podcast by All Day Vinyl. I'm your host, Scott Duddleson. After you finish this episode, please subscribe, rate, and check us out on Instagram and YouTube at All Day Vinyl. Today, I'm excited to speak with a legend. This gentleman is one of the great session guitarists of all time. He helped shape the sound of legendary songs through his studio and touring work with James Taylor, Carole King, Linda Ronstadt, and Stevie Nicks, who he's currently on tour with. He produced three great Warren Zevon albums, co-wrote one of his great songs, Werewolves of London. He's a member of the expensive winos of Keith Richards, and most recently part of a supergroup of legendary session musicians called The Media Family. The Media Family may not be immediately familiar by name, but the musicians in the band are all very legendary. Danny Korchmar, Leland Scalar, Russ Kunkel, Steve Postel, and our soon-to-be-introduced guests have collectively played on over 5,000 albums. Look up any singer-songwriter album from the 1970s, you're bound to come across one or more of these great musicians in the liner notes. I'm pleased to introduce to you the great Wadi Wachtel. Wadi, thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for quite an intro, too. Thanks. I'm really happy that, you know, for the last 50 years, you guys have been contributing to so much great music behind the scenes that in 2023, 2024, you're getting your due to be up front. You know, you're, you have an album right now, Skin of the Game. You've got a movie. So let's, let's start, let's start with the album. Tell me how, how did this come about? The first time the four of us played together, Lou Adler, who produced Carol's records was doing an album for Tim Curry, if you remember who Tim is. Great actor. Rocky Horror. Yeah, exactly. And I was I was a new guy in town, and I had been playing sessions and stuff, but I hadn't yet met Lou Adler. And through David Foster, who came to a session that I was working on, David recommended me for a, a session, and I got a call from Lou. So I walk into this session, and there's Leland, who I had already met, Russell, who I had already met and played with, and there's Danny, who I had never played with, heard him on, on records going, who is this guy, Cooch? And why is he getting all this work? And how the hell do I get in there with these guys? And, and there was Danny. And we loved each other the second we met. We're both New Yorkers, first of all. So <laughs> we had that in common. <clears throat> and it was a reggae song that Tim was doing. That we had that in common. We both were crazy about reggae, early 70s. Part of They Come had just come out. So, so we were just locked in. The four of us locked in immediately. And then the next thing I knew, Lou called me to play on Carol's uh, Thoroughbred record, which we did an album that was great. And then we went on the road and toured it together. So that's where we all. And how did, how did uh, 50 years later, what brought you back together? Well, before that, Danny had a solo album offer from Japan to do a solo record. So he was hoping that some, you know, the guys would be around. Lee and Russ, who happened to be in town. I was on the road with Stevie, but Danny booked a three-day weekend, and I was able to get there for the Sunday. And as soon as we, the five of us started playing, I'd met Steve Postel before. Steve's the new guy. You know, we only known him about 20 years, you know. So, but as soon as we all started playing, it fell right into the slot, and it felt so natural and right. Danny just said, you know, I gotta, I've got an offer to tour after this record it comes out and but i can't do it without you guys it's got to be you guys so why don't we make it a band you know since we are a band really we've been one forever we just didn't know it and and danny right away said i wish you'd call it the immediate family because that's what we are and we all agreed that's exactly what we are and we went from there so we went from that solo record of danny's to getting Cordo valley offered us a record deal so we did our first album, and now we've been lucky enough to get the chance to do a second album, which is now it's a double album. It's had 14 songs on it, but I can't believe that happened. But <laughs> And when you guys, when you guys uh, put together the music, are you co-writing it, or are you each coming together with your own? Uh... Combination. <clears throat> a combination of, of both. There's some songs I wrote by myself. There's some that Danny and I collaborated on. And there's some that the, the three of us collaborated on. And on Skin in the Game, Russell Kunkel's involved in the writing as well. So there, there's collaboration all over the place. And even if there's not, even if one person brings a song in, the way this band works is it's so homogenous that everybody contributes what should be there. You know, So it's essentially a, like an effort of love every time. And, and ease, because we work together for so long, 
I know where Danny's going to be on the neck of his guitar, so I'm not there. Like, like versa versa, vice versa. And Steve Postel <clears throat> can magically fit in between the two of us and not get in the way. He plays a whole different style than either Danny or myself. And Lee and Russ are just this incredible rhythm section that are flawless. So it's it's an incredible happening every time we play, really. Live. It's an incredible bond. And whenever I see the footage of you guys in the 70s playing with Carol King or James Taylor or Linda, it's absolutely it's absolutely amazing. And a lot of that is documented in the in the new movie, the immediate family film. Yeah. Which, which I want to just note for, for the listeners is directed by a gentleman named Danny Tedesco, who is the son of Tony Tedesco, who is Tommy Tom, Tom, Tom Tedesco. Yeah, Tom Tedesco. Great. Tom. The, from the Wrecking Crew. And there was a documentary a few years ago about the Wrecking Crew, which were the legendary LA session musicians who were on all the great records and the immediate family, which is you guys were the great session musicians of the seventies were on all the great music. So I, I want I want to ask you how how that transition because it's important and it's not necessarily addressed in the, in the film how that transition from the Wrecking Crew to you you Danny and Lee and and the well, Media family guys it's an interesting tra- transition because uh, Hal Tommy Larry Nechtel Joe Osborne all these incredible guys Mike Dacey the sessions they did first of all they never left town. They stayed in town, worked session after session after session, making all the records that we grew up listening to. You never knew it was the same guys playing on you know ninety percent of the records you heard. But the way records were made then, you'd come in, there'd be a chart. You'd sit down, you'd play it. Next song, you know, it was a little more factory oriented, really. I would say, and I don't mean to negate the incredible talent of any of the, those men. They were unbelievable. But what happened with us in the 70s, we came to notice, like when I started, I moved from New York to, to LA. I started doing sessions and I was told, all right, so when we do the track, don't mess with your volume. Don't change anything. Don't play a solo. My lights just went crazy. <laughs> Yeah, you look yeah. illuminated. You look beautiful, right? Yeah, it's there. better lighting. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> the lights in this room just kind of went out. Yeah. Um, don't play a solo, but I, I'm the kind of person when I hear a song, <clears throat> I get inspired by what I'm hearing, and I would hear in my mind what I think should be the solo. So, even though I was told not to, I couldn't. I just couldn't help myself. And when the spot would come. I just couldn't see myself sitting there playing rhythm through it when I had the solo in my mind. So I would go for it. I would just do it. And at first, that wasn't really going over well until they listened back and they went, you know, that's pretty good. Yeah, let's keep that. You know, let's keep that. And then that started to be what we got hired to do. We got hired to not only come in and read the chart, we got hired to come in and add what the writers and producers hadn't envisioned. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. We would add this additional music to their music. We would add, I always say our lives are built on counterpoint. Everything that I do as a studio musician, as a musician, is in, is counterpoint to a melody that's being sung by an artist. And when that melody stops and there's these holes in the music, my mind is going, what can fit there? What can I put there? You know, and I would do that. And and likewise for these solo spots. So we got hired more and more. And Danny the same way. And Lee, Lee would always and Lee's an amazing reader. He can read anything. I, I'm I, I'm okay reader, but Lee, he'll read a chart flawlessly. And but he'll always say to them, you know, you know, now that we've done it that way, you know, can I try another one? And if you don't like it, that'll be fine. And a lot of times they'll go, oh, that's great. You know, that's wonderful. Or they'll say, now we like what we had and that's fine. But it, that was the difference. We started getting hired to be us rather than just the guitar player who would come in and play it correctly. And it sounds like the looseness of those sessions allowed for all the great innovations. I mean, in the movie you recount, I don't want to spoil it. People should watch the film, but an amazing story about you filling in the hole on 
Steve Perry's Oh Sherry and how you just take, you know, you hear the melody, you hear the counterpoint right. and you. That, yeah, it's exactly what I just described. It was like, what do you mean? I, there's no solo. I know what it should be, you know? Yeah. And, uh, Nailed it. Well, then also the, also it was the fact that Carol, when she did Tapestry, <clears throat> she'd been working with Danny. She and she, Danny knew she wanted to use her guy. She didn't want to use someone else. And same with James. Russell was playing with James. And they, he, Peter Asher had heard James or heard Russell playing for John Stewart and knew he was the guy to bring in. So he brought him in. And it was like the songwriters, the singer songwriters started to bring in their own people rather than, you know, I was told when I moved to LA, I had a band. <clears throat> the first thing they said was, Okay, you're going to make a record, but you're not going to play on it. I went, what? What are you talking about? You know, you're going to have studio musicians play on it. I said, well, you know, I think I could do it. You know, and then I started meeting studio musicians, session players. And that's when I said, you know, I don't read as well as those guys, but my ear is very quick. I think I could do that for a living. I think I can do that. And thank God I was <laughs> making the right decision. Absolutely. And a lot of those collaborations and people that you've worked with, obviously, right now, the immediate family is going on 50 years. Stevie Nicks, even maybe more, right? You were on the first Buckingham Nicks even before they joined. Yeah. You would yeah Steve, right? you know, Steve, I've known Stevie longer than I've known my immediate family. And that's a long time. Stevie and I met at the end of 70 or beginning of 71 through Keith Olson, the great, late, beautiful friend of ours, beautiful producer brought Stevie and Lindsay down from Northern California. And he said, you got to play on this record. I had, I, I had already met Leland at that point, but that he said, you got to play on this record because they're great. You're going to really like them. They're great singers. They're really good writers. He says, but the, the guitar player doesn't know how to play with anyone else. He doesn't know how to play with another guitar player. So you've got to work with them. I said, okay, fine. And the three of us got along fa fabulous. You know, you have any, you have any recollections of those recording sessions? Anything that can bring us back to that time? Well, Lindsay showed up. He had a, an Ampex four-track machine or two-track machine, and he, he had worked everything out pretty well. So I just had to learn what he was doing. But then I would, I would add my own stuff, like, like I'm saying always. you know. And, uh, but they were great. It was uh, Ronnie Tut was playing drums. I don't remember who was playing bass. Boy, hey, Calderon was around playing bass. But it was just... It was, it was just, the, their songs were magical. And a lot of the stuff, ha, Lindsay had it worked out so well that he just played all the stuff on, on some of those songs. But like Lola, Lola, I played, sli uh, played slide on his song. He never envisioned a slide guitar on that song. And uh, Crying in the Night was interesting. And it's, it's such a drag that that album just flopped, you know, because there's great material on it. Oh, it's, it's grown in stature. Uh, yeah, it has. Years, yeah. And it's the reason they got into Fleetwood Mac, because when Mick heard it, he went, Ooh, with you? you know. But Crying in the Night, I remember they, uh, they picked that to be a single, but Keith Olsen called me. He goes, you got to come in, and we got to read you the guitars on Crying in the Night, because it was basically acoustic. He goes, it's got to be electric, and you got to play slide on it and stuff. You got to dress that thing up. So we made a really cool version of it. You know, the single version is markedly different than the record the album version and i was kind of like a band finger record. came out like a band finger record sort of with the slide and stevie's vocal we did it on the road with stevie for a while but we're not doing it right now. it was a cool song and around around that time i'm guessing was when you were uh, working with the everly brothers and ultimately met warren zivon that i met warren yeah when i played for the everly's and uh I don't know if that, I think consequently, I think 1970 that was. I don't think I'd met Stevie and Lindsay quite yet. I think we met during that period. But that's when I had to audition for the Everly Brothers and I auditioned for Warren Zevon, was the band leader. And we uh, had a, you know, we didn't get along great right away. We <laughs> rubbed each other the wrong way, but. I knew the songs so well. I mean, when I heard that the Everly Brothers needed a guitar player, I just said, well, that's me. I mean, I know every Everly Brothers song. I know every vocal part, I know every guitar part. There's no way I can't get that gig. So I showed up and did the rehearsal with Warren. 
corrected him on uh, there's a song called Walk Right Back by the Evolution. He wasn't playing it right. <laughs> that really didn't go over well when I said, okay. Because he said, all right, we'll play it once and then you play it with us. And I went, well, you know, you could leave out that we'll play it one step because I know these songs really well. And I said, no, no, that's the way we're going to do it. So I got to walk right back and I'm sitting there going, this guy's not going to like this, but he's not playing that figure correctly. And so I corrected him and it didn't go over well. But nonetheless, he said, I think you got this job. You know, you got the job. So, and I said, where are the Everly Brothers anyway? Where are they? <laughs> They said they're making they're out make, they're in the studio making their album. I said, "Well, why aren't you there? What kind of band is this?" I mean, uh, I said, "I'm a studio player. Where? Why aren't you in there?" And he goes, "Hey, man, <laughs> just be happy you get the job." I went, "I am, I am." And then when I left the Everly Brothers, Lindsay and Stevie had no money yet, so Lindsay took the job for a while with with the Everlys playing guitar. I introduced them to Don and Phil. I had no idea. He <laughs> played for a little while. And you were you were on that Everly's brother. Is it called Stories We Can Tell? Stories, yeah, yeah. Because I had made such a stink about it, uh, right? Right. And those were all uh, the reason I bought. I saw that record years ago, and I looked at the back, and I saw all the players on it, and I'm like, wow, this is this is the A list of all great LA musicians. It was, yeah. And we got in there, Warren, and I think Warren got there with me. Both of us got in there, and it was funny because I remember John Sebastian being there, and uh, and we were both like bent over unpacking our guitars. And we both came up with the exact same Les Paul. It was amazing. And then Les, we looked at each other and went, what is this, a mirror? It was like perfect. It was like a Marx Brothers movie where, you know, doing the mirror thing. It was amazing. You know, he remembered that moment too. I spoke to John about it a couple of years ago. How, how did you go from playing with the Everly's and Warren to... Uh, ultimately producing Warren and and what is it like producing Warren Zevon? Sounds like a I love his music and his perspective and his point of view. And if that's how he is or was in person, that must have been a wild experience. It was wild. Yeah. yeah. And he was <clears throat> you know, that was the period where Warren was very alcoholic. So it was a very tough period. I I wound up producing him because I worked on that first album, the blue album I call it, the one Jackson produced. And I went to England with Linda. I think it was with Linda. I might have been to someone else, but I came, I, when I was there, I got interviewed by somebody about that album. And I made the mistake, well, it wasn't a mistake, it turned out to be, but with my big mouth, I said, they said, what did you think of Jackson's production on the album? And I said, well, and it was crazy. I mean, there was a lot of people there during these sessions. It was out of control. Warren was out of control pretty much most of the time anyway. And it was, it was quite a task to get anything done, really. It was hard. So I said, well, quite honestly, you know, I think he had his hands a little too full, you know, and he really didn't know what to do because it was, it was a real, it was tough. You know, it was hard. So when I got home, I said, uh, the phone rang and I pick it up and it's Jackson Brown calling. And I said, well, hey, Jackson, how you doing? He goes, I'm fine. He goes, listen, I read your interview. I went, what? You, you, I thought, you know, I'm in England. No one's ever going to see this in America. I read your interview. You did? Yeah, you know, the one where you said I didn't know what I was doing and I had my hands too full. I went, oh, and before I could say anything, he goes, you're right. He says, you are absolutely right. He says, that's why I'm calling you. I want you, I need you to help me co-produce this next record. I went, you got to be kidding me. I mean, you don't even know me. He goes, I know you well enough now <laughs> to know where I stand with you and where I stand with him, and I need you to help me do this. So I was thrilled, and that's how I got to produce that record with Jackson. And uh, I got to do what I do, which is most of the time is try to lead bands whenever I can. And I could hear Warren's tunes. I could hear the arrangements there should be. So we'd had you know, small bands. And again, it was Russell Kunkel, Lee Sklar, Danny Korchmar came in, Jeff Picaro had all the, the great players in Los Angeles in and out of that studio working with us always. It was fantastic. And the songs were great. And we had our, we had werewolves in the back pocket. And, you know, we didn't know that that was going to be the song that made his name and made 
our life happened yeah. composition wise I had no idea we thought no one's going to like this one you know, that's what we thought <laughs> when the record company picked werewolves to be the single we were aghast warren and i we just went you got to be kidding me of all the songs on this record that's what they want to go with we're thinking we were so wrong and happily so so incorrect in our judgment iconic and and i love that you know the story you recount in the movie about having john mcvee and mick fleetwood on drums and going through 62 takes of this to all to decide that the second take was yeah. the right the right one take two was, yeah you know after we did take two jackson said that was pretty good you want to hear it and mick goes nah let's keep going keep going i went oh okay let's keep going we were so happy they came to do it with us we said let's keep, let's keep going we kept going, kept going. It's like five in the morning. I went, Jackson, take two was good, wasn't it? I was, yeah, you want to hear it? I went, yeah. So we never came in and listened to anything. <clears throat> we just kept going and going. <laughs> it was amazing. And it's take two, what, essentially what we hear as oh, the yeah. final. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah. And then I'm guessing around the same time or approximately you were working with Linda Ronstadt as well. Is that yeah. right? And that'll be the day was the first the first track that you you were on with her? Well, that was the first single at all. Single. I think the first thing I played for her was one of the ballad things. And but that was the first time I heard myself on the radio was on That'll Be the Day. And I freaked out. It was great. She was un unbelievable. And I love I love I love that, you know, three of the most iconic female artists of all time, Carol King, Linda Ronson, Stevie Nicks are musicians who you've collaborated with over the years many many times and closely what what is it what is it that have in their music that you bring to it from your perspective well again it's that <clears throat> that counterpoint word and a, and a melodic a melodic sense of accompaniment you know i mean and it, i don't know if it just coincidentally happened that these three incredibly talented women all dug us so much that we wound up being the guys to play those records. But Stevie, with Stevie, uh, we hadn't seen each other in years. And I got a call from Jimmy Iovine's office. You know, uh, we spent all that time together early before Fleetwood. And once Fleetwood happened, I was with them during the early sessions. I played on the Sugar Daddy, that song, Christine's. And then we went our separate ways. And, and all of a sudden, I got a call from Jimmy Iovine's office saying, you wanna, want you to come play on Stevie Nicks? solo record and we hadn't seen each other in years and we just our our chemistry was so good together obviously because we're still working together and so and linda it, it was just again it was like I, I i added this i added an element of a little more of a rock and roll element to linda's records that i think she was looking for and peter was hoping for and carol like Carol said to me when I met her in the hallway, she looked at me and she goes, are we related? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I hope so. I'm not sure. But we both had, you know, fairly blonde hair. And you know, it was a long time ago. We kind of looked like cousins for sure. <laughs> you know, I wanted that, that, you know, when you bring up related, I heard, I heard a story. And you're not related to this person, but I heard a story. I don't know if this is true, that you grew up with Leslie West from Mountain. I grew up in Jackson Heights, New York. And at one point, when I was 16, my dad, my mom died when I was very young. My dad got married when I was 16. We moved out to a different town. It didn't work out. So my brother, my father, and I moved into Forest Hills, New York. And where we lived, the building was like, there's one building here, this little awning here, and another building here, this little complex, these two apartment buildings. And I was, I was pretty much a truant school. I was, I was much more concerned with staying home, learning songs, playing guitar than I was at sitting in the high school. So it's not a real thing to model after kids, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. But nonetheless, I was doing it. And one day I came out of my building and I heard someone playing guitar, which was really odd. And I'm like, well, is that a guitar I'm hearing? What the hell's going on here? So I went into that building, the other building, 
And I went from floor to floor till I found the apartment it was coming out of. The noise was coming out of. I knocked on the door. And this heavy set guy opens the door. And I said, Are you playing guitar in here? And he goes, Yeah. I said, Oh, okay. I said, um, My name is Bobby Wachtel, and I can help you. <laughs> you need help. <laughs> I was playing, you know, I started playing guitar when I was nine. So by the time I was 17, 18 years old, I knew what to do. You know, I wasn't ready to do sessions yet, but I was, I could play and I could tell Leslie needed help. So that's what I said. You need help. I can help you. So we became brothers. We became such dear friends. And like I said, we lived in the same building. He and his brother, Larry, my, me and my brother, Jimmy, and my dad and he had lived with his mom. They lived with their mom. And so we spent, you know, countless hours together and taught Leslie everything we could. Played drums. When they put their band together, I played drums till they found a drummer. And we spent a lot of time together. That's incredible. Well, you taught him well, apparently. He was my, he's my, he's pretty, ace, pretty ripping. my ace student. And when I heard Mississippi Queen and realized who that was, I went out of my mind. That's some great guitar playing. Also, great guitar playing, and it's obviously we got to we got to mention you play with Keith Richards, and in the film, it's amazing. Keith Richards, he's in there, and he's gushing over you. He fucking loves you. Pretty amazing. <laughs> it's not, tell, tell us how how you end up connecting with Keith Richards, and what is it like being in that rare company to play guitar with him? It's extraordinary. And I met Keith when I was in London with Linda. He came to a show we did, and we bonded right away. We, we dug each other right away. And so when he would come to L.A., I'd see him here and there, and we'd hang out, you know, hang out always whenever we could, and just get together and make noise, sit around, talk, and play a little. And then I got a phone call one day from some British lawyer saying, Hello, Waddy, I'm... Near well, what his name was, near such and such, and I'm an attorney for Keith Richards, and he's looking for you. I said, "Oh, he's looking for me." I said, "Well, you found me. Why don't you give him, give him my number?" And he was great. He was very funny. Listen, would you? He's at Larrabee Studio. Do you know where that is? I went, "Yeah, of course I do." He goes, "Would you give him a call? He wants to talk to you." I said, oh, "Okay." Call up Larrabee, Keith Richards, please, can Waddy. How are you, man? I said, I'm good. What are you doing? How are you? He goes, I'm great. He says, listen, I'm putting a band together and you're in it. I went, what? He goes, yeah, you're the other guitar player. Okay. I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> Fine with me, man. Fine with me. He says, come on. What are you doing? Come up here. And he was, him and Steve were there. Steve Jordan and he were there. They were working on the rock and roll. What do you call it? The Hail, Hail rock and roll movie. The Chuck Berry film, right? Yeah. So I went there at Taylor Hackford and Helen. And the three of us said, we're a band now. And I said, that's fantastic. I love it. Thank you. That's great. He goes, there's no audition for you. You know, that's it. You're the one. And I said, great. And then that was it. That's how I got there. Amazing. Any, any remembrances of the Talk is Cheap album sessions or any key, key yeah. memories that you, you could share? Sure. Plenty. You know, one of the memories is I brought my... That same Les Paul I was talking about that I unpacked with, with John Sebastian, it's, it's an incredible 1960 sunburst, beautiful instrument that over the years had been broken several times, dropped and fallen, and the neck had just been replaced on it, not replaced, but patched. And I brought it with me to Canada. We went to Montreal to do the Talk is Cheap record. And I unpacked it. And as I unpacked it, when I ran my hand up the back of the neck, I could feel the wood was coming apart. I went, oh my God, no. You gotta be kidding me. Oh no, my own my guitar is not working. I can't use my guitar. I had my Stratocaster with me also, but that's my main guy, that that Les Paul. And I was in shock. So I went, oh look, my guitar is fucked, man. I can't use it. And he goes, oh hey, you, you I've got another one here. Use this one. And it was one of these they called it a Les Paul, but it was this bizarre looking kind of black skinny thing with one cutaway and weird instrument. And I'm nervous enough about being there. And how I wish that song, which is on the album, was the first thing we did. And like I said, I would go for solos live. 
I always go. So I'm there playing a guitar I'm not familiar with, a song I don't even know. <laughs> and, and we get to the solo spot and I'm just going for it. You know, that's it. And that was the take. And then after that, the same night, we did the, the single, Take It So Hard. And that was take one, Steve Jordan playing bass, Charlie playing drums, Ivan incredible on the keys, Keith and I on the guitars. And, and the song structure was the melodic thing that was going on was so different than how it wound up being. That, and it, it was amazing. The track was amazing. I mean, we were all like, what? <laughs> That's it. And I had a live solo again. And, and it was so wild because the next day, the engineer said, Keith wants to do that song again. He wants to give it another shot. And we were like, going, what? Oh, okay. I'm going okay. And some of us got a little miffed by it. I went, hey, look, if Keith Richards wants to do something again, we're doing it. Okay? And they went, oh, yeah, okay, okay. So we went in to do it again. Couldn't do it. <laughs> it, was, it just did not work. And I, I looked at Steve. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I don't know. I don't know. I just can't make it happen now on the bass. It's not, not working. And we were looking at, each, well, looking at each other like, well, what? So I said, all right, that's it. The other one's the take. So take one, take it so hard. Amazing. That's a great album. I'm a big fan of, of that you. one. Uh, you also played on Bridges to Babylon as well, right? Yeah. One of the only guitar players outside of Ron Wood, Mick Taylor, or Brian Jones to play on a Stones record. Yeah. Jimmy Page played on it. Yeah, one and Wayne Perkins and Harvey, what was his name? Harvey Mandel. Is that it? Yeah, he played on Hot Stuff. Black and Blue, yeah. 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 And I know I, I was blown away. Pretty badass. I couldn't what's, believe- uh, what's it like being in the studio with, with Mick and Keith and Charlie? Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Very inspirational and long. And a lot of fun. A lot of fun and a lot of great music. Jim Keltner was with me too. Jim and I were there every day for however long that went on. And it seemed to go on for quite a while. And it was astounding. You know, we were just set up in a big circle, playing through small amps, and it was amazing. And I was on the song, the single from that album was this song called uh, Has Anybody Seen My Baby? And Don Was came up to me and said, You're you're gonna play lead on that tomorrow what <laughs> yeah you got to play on that song he said, and he said keith doesn't want to play on it but if you play on it then he'll play on it i go okay so i got there and started playing on it and there was something that sounded funny to me in the track something didn't sound right i went what's going on here and we st- i said don don't you hear this something wrong somebody's playing a wrong chord here it's fine and we soloed all the instruments and found it was Mick. <laughs> it's just Mick, and it's his song, but there was something wrong with the way he was playing this chord. And Don said, "Well, would you tell him?" I said, "Me? I, I'm not producing this. You are." He goes, "Yeah, I know, but could you tell him?" <laughs> I said, "Okay, yeah, sure." And uh, Mick, let me ask you something. In this, I said, "In this, the right chord for that thing?" Yeah, yeah. I said, "Well." You're playing it wrong. Said, what? Come with me. Come here. And we went into the the lounge where he had his notebook and stuff. And it's, they are so diligent about what they do. Both of them, Keith and Steve, Keith and Mick. It's incredible. Um, and Mick has everything written down in this journal ledger. And he showed me. There's anybody see my baby? Well, here's all the lyrics, and above it were the chord symbols. And they were correct. And he goes, isn't that right? Isn't that right? I said, yeah, that's right. But you're not playing it right. He says, well, you fix it. I said, okay, I'll fix it. Yeah. So it was great. Amazing. But it was an extraordinary experience to be with the whole band at that time. Incredible. Well, Wadi, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all the music you've contributed to. Thank, uh, you. thank you for these great stories. And there's so many. What I, what I love about the documentary in particular, you You've just shared a small slice of your amazing history, but when you you know open it up and you talk about the immediate family, and then you add Danny and Russ and Leland, and it's just absolutely, it's absolutely incredible. So, 
thank you guys for everything. It's an amazing reality to have a movie built around us. I'm telling you, it blows us away. Thank you for listening to the Legends Podcast by All Day Vinyl. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate it, share it, subscribe, and follow us and check us out at All Day Vinyl on Instagram and YouTube.